So last time we defined last time. Um, we defined Turan density. Uh, of a graph, which is a a, a limit way of um, stating the early stone schumann theorem, so we can get rid of the annoying little lower order term. Uh, so recall the Turan density of a graph H is just um, we denote it by pi of h uh, equals to the limit n goes to infinity. You take the extremal number and normalize by n choose 2. So it's the, uh, the edge density of the largest, the extremal uh, h3 graph. Um, right. So we just to get more familiar with it, how can we prove lower and upper bounds on Turan density? So by definition, this limit to prove upper bound, upper bound on pi of h, what do we need to do? We need to show that for every epsilon, there exists n naught, which depends on epsilon, right? Such that for any n bigger than n zero, um, we have the extremal number of the uh, h is at most let's say you want to prove this is alpha, right? And you want to prove the upper bound. So at most alpha. You need to prove this is at most alpha plus epsilon times n choose two. And for the lower bound, that pi h is at least alpha. What do we need to prove? We need to show. Um, we open the chat in case someone asks questions. Okay. Uh, so, right. Lower bound, we need to show that um, we can find a family of graphs, Gn, or n vertices, and goes to infinity, each one of which is H3, right? Um, for, for actually large n. And we need to show that its edge density is at least arbitrarily uh, goes to alpha with number of edges, at least alpha minus epsilon, and choose two, okay? We proved last time that um, this always exists. So no, we know that this, we proved last time uh, that pi h exists for all h, um, what we do is do this through this while well, this local averaging argument. Okay, what is local? Last time I said random sampling. I, I don't think maybe that's not a good phrase uh, because later we will see a random sampling meaning something else. So let's call it local averaging, meaning that um, by local averaging, uh, you can find a subgraph that's Is the name correct? Mm, okay, doesn't matter what's the name. So you, by local averaging, you can you can prove that in some you can remove a vertex so that um, the edge density of this one subgraph with one less vertex is at least as large as that of H relative edge density, 
Uh, so this um, normalized fraction is a non-increasing sequence, which is bounded. So by monotone uh, conversion theorem, the limit exists. Uh, so let's restate erdős tonsumanovich theorem. In terms of Turan density, it becomes very clean. So the erdős tonsumanovich basically says, um, pi of h equals to one minus uh, one over chi of h minus one, where chi of h is the romantic number of h. So, um, a remark here we made last time is that uh, Erdős Don Shumanovich theorem gives a satisfying answer when the chromatic number is at least three. So when H is bipartite, so when H is bipartite, then pi of H equals to zero. Chi of H equals to two. Um, in particular, we see that what's the largest if give, given the number of vertices by apartheid graph. So let's, in particular, k, let me write k2 of t is zero. So let me introduce this. This is the blow up of a graph. So what is a blow up of a graph? Let's start with this k2. So if you have a graph h, I will write h of t, it's blow up. Meaning if you, let's start with H equal to K2, okay? Then we blow up each vertex to a set of independent set of T vertices. So this guy becomes this set, you blow it up. And this guy, you blow it up to T vertices. And whenever there was an edge before between uh, these two vertices, we're going to replace it by, we're going to add all edges between the copies of the red and the copies of blue, whenever red and blue were adjacent in the original graph. This is what we call blow up. So uh, in other words, K2T is basically KTT in our notation before. Sometimes it's simple to write it this way. So we know that by Erdős Tonsumanovich that uh, K2T or all com all bipartite graph has uh, Turan density zero. This can be extended to hypergraph. So let me make this remark and introduce hypergraph if I haven't before. Um, okay. Yes, so definition. Or R, let's take a natural number. Let's take a natural number R, one, two, three, four, whatever. Uh, an R uniform hypergraph H. on vertex sets, let's say, uh, let's say n, let's make it specific, n is the first n integers, is a family of r subsets of n. Okay, very simple. So two graph, Sometimes we will, for simplicity, for our uniform hypergraph, I will simply call it, for simplicity, we call it R graph. Okay. For example, what is a two graph, two uniform hypergraph? On the set of vertices, you have a family of two sets, which is pairs. That's the edge. It's just normal graph. This, this, this is just the graph that we've been dealing with. So here's an example. Uh, let's draw a three uniform mix. Three uniform 
hypergraph um, on four vertices. Actually, we're going to draw the complete complete graph, complete three uniform hypergraph on four vertices, which is also called tetrahedron. Okay, how does it look like? You have four vertices, and you have all of its three subsets, r equal to three, as an edge. So these subsets we call it hyper edge, right? We call it hyper edge. Sometimes I just call them edge without mentioning hyper edge. So um, the hyper edges here are all the three subsets. So you have this one. It looks like this. You have um, this hyper edge, these three vertices. You have three these three vertices from a hyper edge. You also have this guy, these three bottom three vertices from a hyper edge. And there's one more. Let's not miss that um purple. If you look at this vertex, this vertex, this vertex, which also form a hyper edge. Okay, I will draw it like this. This is the hyper edge of three vertices. Um, you can actually associate to the the back two phase on this tetrahedron, but you cannot draw it here. Let's do it like this. Uh, all right. What would be a generalization of K2T in the R uniform hypergraph? If you say, what will be a generalization of KTT, complete bipartite graph? This is a complete two-partite, right? Let's write it out. KTT is complete two-partite two-graph. Or it can be also viewed as the blow up of single two edge, an edge of size two, as we illustrated here. So to generalize to R uniform, simply you just change this to R, change this to R, change this to R. Let's draw the case when R equal to three. Another example, r equal to 3. So will be r equal to 3. I think we should write it like this. k, t, t, t. Put the superscript 3 here to indicate that this is a 3 graph. So how does it look like? Um, complete, in terms of the first notation, first uh, complete 3 uniform, 3 part type graph. That means you have vertices partitioned to three parts, as drawn here, and all you have all the edges of the form with one vertex from each. You have all these edges, right? So if, in other words, if this is xi, yj, uh, zk, you have xi, yj, zk edge for all i, j, k in n. Let's say you have m vertices on each. Okay. And um, this can also be viewed as the blow up of a single, single hyper edge. This is a single Three edge. How do we blow it up? In terms of our, our terminology, we blow up vertices to independent sets, and edges correspond to uh, whenever there's an edge between two, between their copies, we also put an edge. So here, we blow up this to an independent set, 
independent set, independent set. And whenever there's an edge, we put an edge between a copy, one of their corresponding copy. So the generalization of this statement, this is what I want to mention. The Turan density, first of all, Turan density can be also defined. First of all, I will leave it as exercise to show that the Turan density of an R uniform hypergraph, if this is R uniform, which is defined to be limit n goes to infinity, extremal number of h, and now we should normalize it by n choose r because the total number of possible edges is all r subset of n. This also exists for all r graph h. Use the same proof as we did in the graph case. So this is an exercise. Second of all, the generalization is this one. This is a theorem um, of Erdős back in the 60s, who proved that for every t at least one and for every r at least two, the Turan density of r graph, r uniform hypergraph, this is the superscript, uh, t blew up of a single r edge, this is r equal to three case, has Turan density zero. So if you take r equal to two, we recover the degenerate case of early stone Shimlovich. The proof of this is not too complicated, but let's do it later when we handle the degenerate Turan type problem. Let's assume this result for now and try to prove uh, the uh, super saturation result that we mentioned last time. Any questions so far? Good. All right. So we mentioned last time this super saturation phenomenon. What is it? Is when, um, when the graph, the edge density goes above, above the Turan density of a graph. So this is larger than say pi of h plus epsilon and choose two. Then by definition of extremal number or the Turan density, there is at least one copy of H and G. But in fact, we will see many, many copy. Many copies of H. And will we be able to show this many is best in the strongest possible sense? And what we meant last time, this many means uh, there will be a positive density, H density will be positive positive fraction. What does it mean? If you uniformly random pick T vertices, if H has, has T vertices, then you will see a positive probability that they form a copy of H. Okay, how do we prove that? This is a very cute application of this result on hypergraphs that blow up of a single edge or R part type R uniform hypergraphs has Turan density zero. Let me first state this uh, supersaturation results. Theorem. Uh, right. Basically I state it here. So let me write it again. For, for any epsilon bigger than zero and any um, uh, h on h vertices, little h number of vertices, there exists. So the quantifier is given any epsilon and h, there exists 
um, delta uh, bigger than zero and n zero bigger than zero such that the following holds for all n bigger than n zero. So what holds for any n vertex graph G with number of edges at least pi of h plus epsilon times n choose two, then um, G contains, G has the H density in G is positive, meaning that it contains a delta times n choose H copies of it. H, what do I mean by positive fraction? Look at this number. This is the total number of H sets that could possibly induce a copy of H. And we are saying that a positive fraction of them is good for us in terms of inducing a copy of H. Any question about the statement? Okay, so how do we prove this? Uh, let me first say the idea. The idea is a simple, uh, simple idea, this averaging How do I give you the name? Uh, I think it's uh, idea is averaging. So let's write it. Yeah, or maybe local averaging. What does it mean? Um, so let's draw a picture to illustrate. This is our graph G. What do we know? We know that it has lots of edges. Edge density goes above to run density of H. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna sample locally some set of vertices, let's say a set of M vertices. M is large. But still, n is, n is even larger. The number of vertices of G is even larger. So this is a small part of, you can think of this as a constant size in terms of G. So still local, independent of N. You sample M vertices, then actually um, a positive fraction a positive fraction of uh, M vertices, M sets, will induce a graph with edge density strictly bigger than pi of h, simply because your original graph has more edges. So if you choose a large enough but still constant, you will see number of edges above that. And by definition, Inside these local parts, there is a copy of H that we're looking for, okay? And that means for every such positive fraction, for every such one, we have one H. But since this is constant size, double counting shows that the number of copies of H that we obtain is of positive fraction. That's the whole proof. So let's write down the details. Um, by the definition of the two run density, we know that we can take a sufficiently large, sufficiently large M, which is which depending only on epsilon. and maybe on H, such that um, the extremal, extremal number of MH is at most pi of H plus epsilon over four times M choose two. 
that's the definition of these, right? When m gets sufficiently large, the extreme number cannot go much above pi of h. And notice that this m, as I said, is constant, independent of n. It only depends on epsilon and h. And this is, will be the size of the local set we're going to pick. Now we need to show that a positive fraction of them satisfy this. This is just by double counting. So let me write it as a claim. We claim that um, at least epsilon over four fraction of all M sets induce inducing uh, a subgraph with more than pi of h plus epsilon over four. I think one of them should be straight inequality. So let me make this straight. Um, M choose two edges. Okay. So each one of these M sets, this is larger than that, will contains a copy of H. Double counting for this claim. Uh, we're gonna count, we're gonna add up the number of edges induced on the subgraph on every M set. So the sum of the number of edges induced on all M sets. So this is V of G. You choose a set of M vertices, all M subset of V. This is M most, let's give it an upper bound. Uh, oh, I need to say suppose otherwise by contradiction. Suppose otherwise, then we have, otherwise means there are uh, less than this many M sets inducing more than this many edges. So at most epsilon over four N choose M sets inducing lots of edges. Each one of them can induce at most M choose two. It's an M set. Plus, for the remaining M sets, there are at most N choose M of them. They induce less than this many. So I write this number here, times pi of H plus epsilon over four, M choose two. Okay, this equals, to, this is equals to pi of H plus epsilon over two, and choose M, M choose two. Now let's bound it from below. Um, how do we bound it from below? Notice that this number, equals to what? Equals to, Um, every edge of G is counted in this sum M minus two, M minus two times. For every edge, how many M sets it's containing is exactly how many times it's counted in this sum. And the number of such M sets, you just simply choose uh, among the rest vertices, M minus two vertices to form a set M. Now we can bound this from below by uh, 
our hypothesis on the number of edges of G, which is pi of H plus epsilon times n choose two times n minus two, n minus two. And these two things are actually the, th the same. This and this are the same. We get a contradiction. Okay, that finished the proof of the claim. So, um, so each one of these M sets contains a copy of H by our choice. So we have this many copies of H, but there's over counting. Each copy of H is, is counted many, many times. How many times? Um, each copies of H is contained in a most this many M sets, right? You have your H here, which has H <laughs> vertices. Then we have to choose another M minus H vertices to form an M set. And number of choices is this many. So this is double counting at most this many times, implying that the number of copies of H and G is at least uh, epsilon over four and choose M divided by the over counting factor, which is at least This can be rewritten as this is at least this guy times and choose H. You can take then this guy to be your A delta. That finishes the proof. Any question? Let's see an application of supersaturation. There are many applications. Mm, at the later, maybe at the second half of this course, we will see some methods. Supersaturation is a key ingredient in, for example, this container method, hypergraph container methods. Here, let's prove some elementary application. Uh, we can use supersaturation to give another proof of Erdős-Stone and Schumann-Wich theorem. So, application, we're going to show that, so application, this is the plan. Supersaturation, we will prove that using that to prove that uh, a graph and any graph and its blow up have the same Turan density. Which then can be used to give another proof of Erdős Don Shumlovich. Okay. Let's first see the first arrow. What does it mean? Um, this is this proposition. As it's written there, we introduce what's a blow up. So, uh, uh, 
I will prove, let me see. I will only prove the case, this ending graph is um, complete graph. Okay, I'll leave it as exercise to prove for any graph. We prove here, we prove only for this guy. Only for clicks, complete graph. So what is it for any, the two run density of a complete graph and its blow up is the same proof. This direction is trivial as KR is a subgraph of its blow up, which has, and subgraph has smaller, and the Turan density cannot be larger than its supergraph. So we just need to look at this direction. For well, this direction, we need to show, what does it mean? Um, pi of KRT is at most pi of KR. We need to show that extreme number of KRT, the blow up, is at most pi of KR plus epsilon uh, times n choose two. Here I skip the quantifier. This just means for every epsilon, um, there exists n zero such that for m bigger than n zero, we need to prove this. Okay. Now, uh, how do we prove this? Basically, this how we use super, the idea is. Let me first say the idea. We given the graph G with this many edges, and we want to embed this guy, right? So let me write it down. In other words, i.e., for every G with uh, this many edges, we need to embed KRT in G. What we know from supersaturation is that there is uh, there are many, many copies of KR in G. Positive fraction of R sets induce a complete graph. And somehow if we can glue this many copy of KR together, then in a, in a nice, or nice way, if they line up perfectly, we will get a complete R partite, which is the blow up. So how do we align the many, many copies of them together is to is through this result of Erdish by defining auxiliary hypergraph and show that um, this auxiliary graph has positive edge density. So you must have a copy of blow up of a single R edge, which correspond to a blow up of KR. So, um, by super set, as I said, by super saturation, uh, G has positive fraction of uh, uh, delta n choose R copies of KR. Now we build auxiliary auxiliary R uniform hypergraph. And let's call it the 
F, okay, where the vertex set of F is just the same as vertex set of G, and the edge set of F, the hyper edges, hyper edges, are copies of KR in G. So every KR, every R set in G, if, if they are a complete graph in G, I make a hyper edge of F. By the super saturation, I know that this F has many, many edges. So E of F is at least number of edges is delta n choose r, which means f has positive edge density. By early results, as the Turan density of k, a single blow up of a complete r partite r uniform hypergraph, will take. H here, always T, is zero, we get that um, we have a copy of this in F. And the copy of that, which is, is exactly this, which corresponds to a copy of KRT in G as desired. That's the proof. It's very simple. Um, so now we can prove, we give another proof of early stone Shimano edge. This is uh, the third proof, right? We have the classical combinatorial proof using double counting, induction, and, 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 and averaging. And then we have this modern proof using embedding lemma as a black box. Now it's a third proof, which looks a little bit like the second proof. So proof three, third proof of early Stone Shimovich by our super saturation. Um, so what do we need to prove? Fix H with chromatic number R. We need to show pi of H equals to one minus one over R, right? If chi of H is R plus one, we need to show one minus one over R. And um, suffices to show pi of H equals to pi of kr plus one. Because by Turan's theorem, we know the edge density of kr plus one is one minus one over r. And, um, okay, we're almost done. Uh, note that H is a subgraph of KR plus one T, where T is, say, the number of vertices of, oh, why this keeps popping up? Say the number of vertices of H, okay? Which means what? A subgraph, H, the, its Turan density cannot be more than its supergraph. So pi of H is at most pi of KR plus one T. But by the above proposition, we know that for complete graphs, the Turan density is the same as its blow up. So it's the same as pi of KR plus one. Okay. This proved the less than equal here. 
greater equal is simpler, is even simpler. So this for the lower bound, just consider pi of h bigger than pi of kr plus one. Just consider m vertex r partite um, Turan graph, which is h free. Okay, because whatever subgraph here must be all colorable, but the chromatic number of H is R plus one. A nice application, giving us yet another proof of early stone and Schumann H. Any questions? Okay. Let me leave some quick exercises for you to uh, get familiar with this Turan type problem. Um, we are talking about forbidding a single graph here. We can have a multicolor uh, version of this problem. So multicolor version. What does multicolor version means? We say a graph is say K3, K3 free. We know what's K3 free. It just means there's no triangle. What does it mean K3, K3 free? Uh, that means you can count on the edge set of G into red and blue such that red is triangle free and blue is triangle free. If the edge set of G can be two colored with no monochromatic um, triangles. So exercise to get familiar with this type of problem is let's write this as the extreme number of the two color version. So if your graph is K3, K3 free, M vertices, what's the maximum number of edges? Okay. Maximum E of G where G has M vertices and G is K3, K3 free. And the exercise is to determine Exercise two is um, the when G has for any G M vertices with uh, this many edges. This implies that G has a copy of KR, right? But now, by definition of extreme number, and now we prove, try to prove something stronger. Prove that, in fact, G contains a copy of AR plus one minus, what's this graph? Which is a, this is the R plus one complete graph with one edge removed. So for example, if R equal to three, This is K4 minus, okay? Prove this. 
Um, the remark here I want to make is that why I give this exercise, uh, this above exercise actually shows that the extremal number of kr plus one minus is the same as the extremal number of kr, exactly the same. For generic graphs H, remember in early stone, there's usually a plus little o n square error term. Here, there's no error term for this specific graph. More generally, we know that there's no error term for a larger family of graphs that's so-called color critical. This is the remark. So, um, so a graph H is color critical if there is this an edge E in H such that removing E from H reduces its chromatic number. Okay, example, AR plus one minus, for example, and odd cycles, for example. Odd cycles is chromatic number three. Removing any edge, you become a path. Chromatic number is two. Here is the KR minus with R equal to three. Chromatic number is three, right? <coughs> you can remove this edge, and the chromatic number, it becomes a C4, which has chromatic number two. <coughs> So in fact, for all color critical graphs, so this is a theorem, generalizing this exercise above, generalizing this guy, is that for any color critical H, um, extremal number of H, equals to the corresponding click problem where the number of clicks is chi of h. So this two has the same chromatic number. Uh, okay, that's the first remark. Second remark is, what about non-color critical graphs? Can we say anything about the error term? Okay. Another remark is, error term for general H. Here's an example, just to illustrate. Let's see a specific example. This is a theorem of Olubash, Erdish, Shimonovich, and Samaredi. Proving that this graph K two two T. So this is complete three part graph with two vertices. On, two, on one and first and second part and t vertices on the last part equals to n squared over four. This is the main term because we know this guy has chromatic number three. Then by early Shimonovich, the main term is the same as triangle, the complete graph on, with the same chromatic number. And the error term plus two times, so they can prove uh, exact results here equals to two times n over two times k to two, which is c4. So this is error term. Um, in general, the error term, in this case, we know exactly what it is. In general, it's controlled actually by 
bipartite degenerate Turan problem. So this is the remark. The error term is controlled by stable L. Uh, is controlled by um, so-called decomposition family. Actually, let me write like this. It's controlled by uh, uh, extremal number of a family of bipartite graphs related to H. This is so-called decomposition family. I'm not gonna talk about this here, just to mention for whoever interested, this is what control their uh, low order term. Any question? Okay. Uh, so we've seen one proof of supersaturation, which is through this local averaging. Okay. If you go above the Turan density, then by local averaging, a large but constant size set we have will have positive probability uh, with number of edges going above the Turan density. Name, namely, a constant size set will have positive probability and hence a copy of forbidden graph H. Then uh, you'll get a positive fraction of H sets can, inducing a copy of H. So here, let's give another proof of supersaturation through yet another very classical inequality relating the click density of different size in the graph. This is the Moon and Moser's inequality. So um, let's give a notation. We will write little kr of g for the number of uh, copies of kr in the graph g. Do I need to define anything else? No. Okay. Okay. Very, we just need one notation. KR of G. So what's this Moon and Moser theorem? For any M vertex graph G, we have, um, if you look at the ratio of R plus one click in G and R click in G, we can bound it from below by this quantity, by the ratio of the previous pair
minus n. I think it's for every r at least two. Otherwise, kr minus one is trivial. It comes k zero. What's k zero? We only care about k one, right? From k one and above, number of vertices is k one. Okay, so for every r at least two, we have this inequality. Um, let's see the consequence. So in particular, uh, we have, we can bound the clique density from below using edge density. Um, Maybe let me write corollary instead. We can use Moon and Moser to bound clique density from below using edge density. So corollary of Moon and Moser, um, if number of edges can be written as one minus one over X, N squared over two for some real number X, then, Number of copies of G in R is at least XR and choose X to R. So look, this is larger than N to R. So this is the pos all possible R sets. And here, this is um, absolute constant depending only on R. So it's a constant, meaning that the KR density in G is positive. So this is exactly supersaturation for clicks, right? Supersaturation. This is basically proof two of supersaturation. While Moon and Moser. I will leave this as an exercise. Derive corollary from Moon and Moser. Just computation is from this. So let's prove this guy. Um, I will only prove it for R equal to two, the simplest case. And the general case can be proved by extending this idea, the double counting idea. I'll leave it as exercise. Okay. So we're gonna prove R equal to two case. Let me write down what does R equal to two case means here. So R equal to two, this is triangles. This is number of edges. This is number of edges. This is the number of vertices, K1. So let's write it out. We prove the R equal to case of MM and leave general case as exercise. So proof. For R equal to two, we need to show that, um, let's try it, number of triangles in G divided by number of edges, K2 is number of edges, so let me write E of G is at least one over three, that's one over R squared minus one, four E of G divided by N minus N. That's what we want to prove.
some strange inequality. Looks a little bit strange. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna, um, the idea is double counting. Double counting the number of pairs, let's call P, Let's call this guy P, the number of pairs. What's this pair? Well, you have the pair of, of two, two sets. The first one induce an edge, and the second one is a non-edge in G. So we're gonna count this thing, three vertices. This is an edge, this is an, a non-edge. I don't care. We don't care what happens between these two vertices. Could be the edge, could be another edge. Where E is an edge, E bar is not an edge, and as a set of size two, their intersection is one. So they have a common vertex. So to count this guy, let's count it from above and from below. Let's define some uh, notations to help us count them. So uh, let's name all the edges. Let E1 dot the dot to EM to be an enumeration of all edges, we'll give them a name, be all edges of G. And let's also name the vertices V1, to Vn, so we have m vertices, m edges, be all vertices of G. Let's define another thing. Let uh, Ti to be the number of triangles containing the ith edge. So how does it look like? This is EI. The number of vertices here, common neighbor of M points of EI, I call it TI. The number of them, common degree. And that's right for simplicity. Also, Vi to be the degree of Vi in G, the i vertex. Now we can count such pair. Let's count it. When we count it from above and from below, we put these two bounds together, and the desired in oops, the desired inequality will pop up. That's the proof. So let's first bound it from above. How do we count P? P equals to one hand, P equals to one. If you count it from this point of view, from the mid, uh, the intersection vertex point of view, then ranging over all vertices, we take one of his neighbor and take one of his non-neighbor. So ranging from all the vertices V1 to Vn, we take one of his neighbor, which is Di choices, and take one of his non-neighbor. There are m minus one minus Di non-neighbors. This then by convexity, Jensen's inequality, 
If you don't know Jensen's inequality, look it up and try to learn it. Basically, all he says is that by this is a convex function, and this is maximized when all the i's are as equal to each other as possible. So in other words, if we define d bar to be the average degree, average of di, what is, what is it? Sum of all degrees, i from 1 to n, divided by n. This is the average degree, which, remember by handshaking lemma, is 2 times the number of edges. Number of edges we define to be m, divided by n. OK, so this, by uh, Jensen's inequality, it's maximized when all di equal to d bar. So it's at most, since all di becomes d bar, every term is the same. We have n terms. So n times d bar, m minus 1 minus d bar, where d bar is 2m over n. So write it out in terms of function of m and n. It looks something like this. Very simple. Now let's count it in a different way. We want to count this guy. We count it from the perspective of this edge E. On the other hand, Count it from the perspective of this edge. Let's say it's I, the ith edge. All we need to do is to you fix the endpoint, right? You find a non-neighbor of this guy. That's it. But this non-neighbor, this guy, must lie. Oops. Must lie outside of the common endpoints of EI. Okay, that's how we count them. So let's let me draw this picture again. Ti is their common neighbor. And you must pick one vertex out of these common neighbors. So ah. Every vertex out of this blue block is not adjacent to at least one of them. Otherwise, you'll be in here, right? So that will give you P at least sum over all edges from E1 to EM. So you pick an edge and you pick one out of this blue. That will give you this. And you have M minus two vertices apart from the endpoints of these two, minus ti. Okay. This equals to m times m minus 2, just the first term, minus the sum of i in 1, m ti. And um, the sum of all triangles the sum of ti, which is the sum of triangles containing every edge, ranging over all edges, uh, it's not hard to see that this equals to three times the number of triangles of G. Because every triangle in G is counted three times. It's counted this guy, this triangle is a triangle containing this edge, also, it's a triangle containing this edge, yeah, so it's a triangle containing this edge. Count it three times. So we have this equals to m, m minus 2, minus 3, k3, g. Now, if you put these two bound together, lower bound, upper bound, finishes the proof. The proof is simple, but I noticed I didn't define something here. Uh, 
This binomial coefficient is only defined when s is a net positive integer. For positive real, how do we define it? In a similar way, this is defined as uh, plus x, x minus 1, the top, x minus r plus 1 um, over r factorial. So we can define it for every x strictly bigger than r minus 1. We can define it. If x is at most r minus 1, we let it be 0. This gives uh, another proof of uh, supersaturation for the clique supersaturation. Okay. The important problem here is that we see we given the edge density, we can give a lower bound on the click density. Is this tight? Is it optimal? That turns out to be a very hard problem. And nowadays it's solved, so-called click density theorem. But we we will not talk about it here at the first part. Maybe later when we get into more advanced parts, we, we we're gonna mention that. All right, um, one more result I want to mention without giving a proof. Again, proof we might provide it later. It's an interesting phenomenon of uh, the click density versus blow up. What do I mean by this? So recall that in the first proof of early Stone Shumanovich, we actually show that we show. that um, if the number of edges is bigger than one minus one over r minus one plus epsilon and just two, then in fact, you have a blow up of kr where um, this t can be taken to be log n size. So this blow up can be of size related to n, the host graph, log n. This log n is not hard to see that it's optimal. This log n is optimal by considering random graph. We're going to talk about this later, uh, about random graphs. But let me just mention that this is optimal. We cannot hope for a uh, blow up larger than log n. The interesting result I want to mention without proving is that, so um, let's write it. We know if the number of edges bigger than one minus one over r minus one plus epsilon times n choose two, we know by Oops. We know by Perdestone Shumanovich, this first proof above, it contains a KRT where T is log n. Okay. We also know that by supersaturation,
that um, when you go above, you have positive fraction of number of kr in g is positive fraction n to the r order of magnitude. That's what we proved. And improving that blow up and the graph, the blow up of a clique has the same neuron density as itself. We actually managed to glue some of them together to get a copy of that, but only for constant size. So um, one strengthening that's proved by Nikiforov is that this weaker hypothesis is enough to guarantee uh, this blow up. So once again, ESS says that if your edge density is above KR minus one, you can get the blow up of KR log n size blow up. Nick Forov strengthened this result by deriving the same conclusion with a weaker hypothesis because this is a consequence of the edge density condition. Right. Uh, There's one more remark I don't know if I mentioned or not. Before we talk about um, supersaturation results, right? For graphs. And in fact, uh, for hypergraphs, supersaturation is again true using basically the same local averaging arguments. So here's the remark. Determining Turan density, so the hypergraph Turan problem, basically, of hypergraphs is much harder, much, much harder than the graph problem. To see how hard it is, what will be the simplest case with one can think of the tetrahedron? So the Turan density of the tetrahedron is unknown, which is one of the major open problem in hypergraph Turan problem. Okay, that just shows how hard it is, how difficult it is, hypergraph Turan problem. But even though we don't know many of the, the, the remark is that even though we do not know the values of most of uh, values of Turan density, of most of the hypergraphs, um, we can still prove that supersaturation phenomenon occurs for all hypergraphs. Okay, so exercise state the supersaturation statement for R in hypergraphs.
and prove it. The hint is that use the same local averaging argument that we've seen in this class. There are a couple of minutes left. Let me see. Maybe I will stop here. And um, what we're going to do next is, so, so far we've seen a uh, two-round type problem. We have, we're determining the two-round density of all graphs. And we've seen what happened above this two-round density. We have supersaturation. Now we're gonna, in the next, we're gonna study what's going on below this Turan density. In particular, we're gonna study right below the Turan density. Can we say something about the structure of such graphs? Now the answer, the short answer is yes. Uh, uh, it comes with a rich story of uh, this so-called stability phenomenon. Okay. Any questions? Next time, stability. So what happens below to run density? No, if there's no question, let's continue on Thursday. Okay, thanks for listening.